digital privacy doesn't always make headline news. Unless, of course, celebrity nudes are leaked or compromising corporate emails are made public. But our relationship to the internet has reached an unprecedented level of connectedness. In this new environment, the state of privacy deserves a closer look. In this film, I'm going to travel the world to undergo challenges that explore our digital life in the 21st century. I'll be stalked. I'll be hacked. I'll fight to get leaked documents back. I'll dive into open data. And then I'll live in a futuristic home that will monitor my every move. All to examine 21st century privacy. But how did we get here? Before the 1600s, most people's homes were communal, life oriented around a central fireplace. There was very little privacy or personal space. And then a revolutionary new technology, the chimney. People could lock themselves and their things in personal spaces. They began to appreciate their privacy and expect that what happened behind closed doors stayed there. The rich have always had better control over their privacy. In 1890s Boston, Warren and Brandeis were attorneys for the high society. So the next tech innovation came along. Their clients had grown accustomed to letting their hair down behind closed doors. When photographs of their dinner parties landed on the front pages of gossip rags, they were suitably outraged and sued them. They won, and the right to privacy was born. Now that was fine until the next big tech innovation came along and put a device into our homes and our pockets that lets us air our dirty laundry to the world. Our attitudes and the law haven't caught up yet. I'm in Los Angeles to meet Max, a professional digital detective who works with businesses and celebrities to protect their online reputations. I gave him just my name and then challenged him to gather as much information about me from what I'd willingly shared online. Are you ready to go through the box? I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> to be fair. Let's walk you through it. This is scratching the surface. <laughs> this is essentially a couple of hours of work. That's pretty deep. You have a pretty sizable digital footprint, yeah. mm -hmm. and most of this represents media that you put out yourself. You might say to me, well, my life is an open book. I'm not worried about you revealing any of that information. But if I'm looking to go after you and to get you to do something you might not want to do, mm. I'm going to use anything at my disposal to create some sort of psychological leverage. All right, what is now that? Now we get into your social media footprint. Right. OK. Yeah, these are all terrible pictures that I took with silly hair and lots and lots of selfies. and places that you go that you yelp about. So your physical location yelp? starts to reveal itself. Documenting yourself and capturing clues that you might not have intended. All of this I've intended. Absolutely all of this I've intended. You've got a grin on your face <laughs> that says that we're about to dive into. Yeah. OK, so now we're getting, how did you find all of my addresses? Because you did a <gasps> registration, because you signed a document, your previous addresses, pieces of ownership, yeah. and photographs from the inside. Wow. Oh my gosh. Because now that's on Airbnb. So again, we do the walkthrough of your spaces. Yeah. My assets. I'm gaining more and more personal information, yeah. including... That's my business addresses, tax exemptions, all of my company business. Yes. Your worth. Yeah. Your finances. Wow. And this goes into a larger question of how companies are treating their technology and their policy, if they even have a policy. Yeah. In many cases, I've seen it's an afterthought. In startup mode, many companies, they hire their developers, and then information policy comes much, much later. But doing it from the beginning, as you can see, when you register that domain, when you start creating these corporations, you're starting that footprint. So you need to control it from the beginning. Yeah. And so what we're looking at here is a pile of things that have been indexed. And then over time, as software gets more sophisticated, they'll get more searchable and obtainable. We cast long digital shadows. Imagine the footprint left by a business with hundreds of employees, all with the company email address, all contributing to the online reputation. And this is just data willingly put in the public domain. But what happens when data that isn't for public consumption ends up in the wrong hands? Information we assume is secure, like financial details, credit card numbers, health records, business correspondence. 
When a business falls victim to a sensitive data breach, the consequences can be particularly devastating. In order to get a better idea of this threat, I'm going to face it head on. I'm going to get my Guardian computer hacked. The first hacker struck at a live telegraph event in 1903. John Fleming was not at all pleased that prankster and magician Neville Maskelyne chose to insert insulting Morse code into his fancy demo. Modern-day hacking started with a phone line. Freakers, as they were known, spent the 1970s making free international phone calls. In 1981, however, the first freaker was convicted in the U.S. for hacking. But this hack helped to expose the holes in the phone system. In 1988, the Morris worm hit an early version of the Internet, exposing vulnerabilities in this technology. In 2000, the love letter worm infected 10% of the world's internet-connected computers, causing almost 9 billion US dollars in damages worldwide. It was a casually created joke by two friends in the Philippines. In recent years, the new breed of geeks are being hired by governments, financial systems, and corporations to both attack and defend. In order to get a better idea of this threat, I'm traveling to Las Vegas. Here, annually, for the past 20 years, international hackers have been gathering to show off their skills and to exchange techniques. We already know what can be learned about me through a legal search, but what can be uncovered with these specialist skills? With my Guardian computer, I'm visiting two hackers. Can they hack my laptop? What is a security situation like in the Middle East, say, compared with Europe or the US? I think the whole region is somewhere between five to 10 years behind as far as awareness of the importance of information security, mainly because the media doesn't really talk about it. In the States, you turn on any TV channel and there's a story about a big hack and because these things happen and they're publicized. Yeah, I've just got an email from right. my director. He says there's a good article on the front page of The Guardian. So, oh Lord, there's nothing but bad news down here, is there? That's the world for you. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Except there's a cool picture from NASA. Now, as you're browsing through The Guardian, I just stole your credentials, so I have your email address, digitalbeadders.com, and the password is Norris under you, which is a very nice Guns N' Roses song. Thank you very much. And I'm actually compromising your whole machine. I could have downloaded files, or I could just do what we like to call a Rickroll, which is redirecting your browser. So Never going to give me... I just sent you to Rick Astley. You and did. It. How did you crack my computer? The website you're on is not actually The Guardian. If it you looks look like it, The Guardian. No, it is. But if you look at it carefully, which people don't really do on the URL, it actually says The Guardian. So I, yes. I added an L in there. But yes, that, you did. Yes, I did. But you did. Yes, I, it so was I, added. No, I actually registered the website theguardian.com. That's I, available. It was not anymore, and so <laughs> I cloned a live version of the actual Guardian website, so yeah. you wouldn't know that you're not there. No, it looks exactly. I mean, it looks right. like the Guardian. And then it's yeah. enough to take control of your whole computer because you actually gave me access yep. just by clicking on the link. Okay, I clicked through right. to the link from a person who sent me an know. email whom I trust. Well, your Facebook is out there, your LinkedIn is out, is out there, and we can find out who you're associated with, and then we can get their email out of their LinkedIn or their Facebook, and it's a very easy fake. Is it as easy to do this to, to company computers? It's, it's probably easier because out of 100 or 1,000 people, you know, it's more than probable that at least some of them will click the link. Every year, international hackers converge in Las Vegas to attend a series of conferences, DEF CON, B-Sides, and Black Hat. Over a few weeks, they exchanged the latest hacking and security tricks and techniques. We're here in Vegas, kind of in the belly of the beast. Are there any examples of this kind of exploitation happening in, you know, in the wild? Sure. In the old days, and by old days, I mean five years ago, we used to do a lot of USB-based attacks where we would drop them around parking lots, and that was really common. So what I want you to do is just sort of plug that in. For one, you don't ever want to stick anything into your computer that you don't actually know what it is. Right. At this point, I can do anything I want to your computer. I can do a keylogger, I can download, upload files. And you can see here that we're in the C user Alex's directory. We notice that you have some 
business files and some personal files. I do, yeah. We're going to go ahead and download those to our computer. Mm. I don't want you to have that. So now we could do a lot of things. I could take screenshots from your camera. Of you, me? Of you. We could record the sound. And then we're able to download a file to your computer. Mm. It's moving. And set it to your desktop background. <laughs> That's a fantastic picture, guys. <laughs> I've been hacked. Correct. <laughs> what about for corporations? How are they vulnerable with this kind of thing? We've done a number of penetration tests where we've gone to you know, our local computer store, we've bought 10 or 20 keyboards, we've soldered one of these devices in every single keyboard, and we've you know, packed them up in a box and just sent them to the company. And what we've done is uh, you know, put a fake letter in there that says, hey, we're from HP, we really want you to check out our new keyboard, we're hoping if we give you these 20 free models that you'll buy 10,000 of them down the road because they're so great, you know, please try these out. And nobody resists free stuff. I mean, and if you make it expensive enough and nice enough, people will use it. But humans are humans. Is there anything that companies can do? I would say basically it's awareness training. You can have all the firewalls you want and you know all the password policies. If they're just gonna get online and click on any link that's sent to them, then it renders all of that moot. Sometimes we have to sacrifice some convenience for safety. If it's too good to be true, either in an email format or something you found on the ground or something somebody sent you, it probably is. Wow, it was quite unsettling to see how easy it was to get hacked, but the consequences of getting hacked aren't always destructive. Sometimes it ends up exposing corporate vulnerabilities or flaws that a business can then address and improve upon. Certainly from this hack, The Guardian will be more astute with its domain registration. Thankfully, none of my personal or The Guardian's business data was subsequently leaked online. But what if it had been? How can we start to take control? And what can we do to get information we never wanted to be on the internet removed? There are clearly examples where taking action to remove content from the internet can have negative consequences. So there's an example where Barbara Streisand had some photos of her beachfront property published online in a public archive. She tried to sue the photographer to take the images down. And the result of that was, was a much larger public outcry and the image went effectively viral online as a result of the action that she'd taken. So I think the very first thing is just to be conscious that if you put something on the internet, there's no guarantee that it, it stays secure and, um, and under your control. I think companies need to have some sort of incident handling plan to know when something does occur, and, and it will, how are they going to respond to that so it isn't just a panic in the business at that time. I guess what we see in, in many companies is they've moved to adopt the new technologies because they bring great business benefit, but they've not thought through necessarily the risk. How do you ensure that that information doesn't make you vulnerable? It really depends on where the data is. So if it's, uh, you know, it's linked through somewhere like Google, Twitter, Facebook, there are, there are removal procedures you can go through. But if your data is on a, you know, a Russian hacker site somewhere, they're unlikely to respond to a takedown request. So the best you can do is to try to mitigate the consequences. So for both businesses and individuals, once the information is out, it seems nearly impossible to take back control of it. Since the earliest days of human communication, we quickly learn the importance of confidentiality. It's been good business. 3,000 years ago in the Middle East, potters used cryptography to keep their glaze formulas secret from competitors. Particularly during conflict, protecting correspondence has always been of the utmost importance. But it wasn't just military and business information we sought to protect. In 400 BC, the writers of the Kama Sutra recommended that lovers encrypt their messages to keep them from prying eyes. Now in the 21st century, we're exchanging more business and personal information than ever before. Though, we've relinquished control of this data to governments and a handful of corporations. Often, instead of safekeeping this material, we found that they're exploiting it. To learn about preventative techniques, my next stop is Berlin, where I'm meeting Stephanie Henke. Her organization provides tips, tools, and techniques to individuals such as journalists and activists whose lives depend upon retaining control of their digital privacy. If you're interviewing people, it may be just as important for you as a journalist that somebody from the outside can't see who you're talking to. Let's say about a phone call that we might have. We might think it needs to be encrypted so people don't know what we're talking about. 
And sometimes that's true, but very often what's more important is that we're having a conversation. Not that we're just having a conversation now, but that we also talked last week, and that today we talked for an hour, and that's metadata. What other forms of data might be collected about me? You know, for example, if you're walking around a city, in order for the phone to know where you are, to look at a map, whatever, you have to have location data on. If you look on your iPhone, in the system services section, Ah, lo and behold, down, uh, somewhere buried in a menu. There's a frequent locations. Most people are quite surprised when they look at it because it gives a kind of overview of something. For example, it even guesses where your home is. Wow. When you start to look at the patterns, then you can start to see things like, you know, probably when you um, come into the house after work, when you leave in the morning, those kinds of yeah. things. You can't stop there, but what you can do is sometimes switch off location services, for yeah. example. So what are companies doing with this metadata? These companies are not yet very transparent about what they're doing with the data. Some of that's profiling and advertising and so on, but some of it's gone much further. For example, LinkedIn is also using their large-scale analysis of the data to advise governments. And that becomes very complicated because people are not thinking that they're contributing to that sample. In the modern world, a huge amount of information is collected about each of us as we go about our daily lives. Whether we disclose it willingly or unwittingly, this valuable data is now a commodity that is traded amongst a handful of companies. Trading data is hardly a new thing. We've always benefited from sharing information. It's helped to advance civilization. The internet is the latest in a long line of technologies that have ushered in great innovations and social change. Ancient trade routes introduced mathematics and astronomy from Arabia, weapons and vaccinations from China, and spices and philosophies from the subcontinent. The printing press blew apart traditional hierarchies, letting the people interpret and proclaim, rather than those in power. The telegraph brought the world infinitely closer together, totally disrupting business, governance, and the judicial system. And every step of the way, the powers that be tried to claw back control. Today, there are three billion people communicating through the internet. This latest network has given each of us the empowering ability to collaborate, share, and exchange information rapidly and efficiently. What if there was a way to harness it for the collective good? I'm headed to Japan, where I'm going to volunteer to test radiation levels using a community-built Geiger counter. I'll use my data to help map the fallout of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. After the disaster in March 2011, information about radiation hazards that was being released by the government was at best incomplete, often contradictory, uh, and ultimately not really reliable. So we felt it was one thing to say, oh, my government tells me the radiation level is X, I guess I'll believe it. And, or to go out there and measure it yourself. I mean, if you measure it yourself, then you really can have confidence in that data. So SafeCast was really formed to allow citizens themselves to gather the information that they needed and to disseminate it in a very free way. SafeCast Geiger kits are open source. Through building the devices themselves, people learn how the technology works. And as a consequence, many have offered both hardware and software improvements. This has helped to rapidly evolve the design. People from all sorts of walks of life participate, anti-nuclear or pro-nuclear, teachers, housewives, anyone can build it and submit data. How can organizations wisely protect the data that they're collecting? I think the most important thing that we found the need to protect is privacy. For instance, the privacy of volunteers. We allow them to actually participate anonymously. In Fukushima Prefecture, there was concern that uh, people, you know, would have uh, radiation levels in their front yard uh, publicized and that this could somehow affect them negatively. And because of that, we decided to use a hardware hack to allow them to put the data in a grid of 100 meters that doesn't identify that data spot with any one particular person's property. How much of Japan has been mapped? We argue that we have been able to provide a wider coverage of radiation surveys than the government has. And this is because of the activities of very active volunteers. Certainly, Fukushima has been repeatedly mapped for three years and more. But there still are a few corners that no volunteers have been to. So today we can go to a park in Koto Ward uh, called Kiyosumi Park, and we can check that out. We're looking at 0.1 microsieverts per hour. This is about normal, you know, pretty average for Tokyo. 
How does that compare, though, with, say, somewhere like the epicenter of the accident? This is a piece of a deck that one of our volunteers was building when the disaster happened in the town of Koryama, which is one of the fairly radioactive places in Fukushima. Ooh, listen to that. <laughs> you can, yes. You can hear it. It's like the, it's yeah. like the scary it's, noise. It's, the it's, ear and all it's already now the 10 ads. times what it was. This is a very radioactive that sample. That is significantly higher. And this is the degree of fallout that was everywhere in that area. Inside the highly radioactive places in Fukushima Daiichi reactor itself, it's a thousand times higher uh, or more. Now, uh, getting to a point where technically, because of the hardware and software tools, things that were previously only possible. Uh, if you were a government or a large research institution, now a high school kid can do. And this is only going to get better and quicker and easier and cheaper. And we are trying to show the potential of that. This is an example of the agile development that organizations can use when they open up and engage their contributors. By introducing privacy measures, SafeCast has built confidence in their project and trust amongst their collaborators. This is an increasingly important consideration as by 2020, it's estimated that there will be 30 billion things connected to the internet. I'll explore the privacy and data implications by spending 24 hours in a technology-laden smart home. Technology liberates us to pursue things we would rather be doing. It always has done. Back in Iran, agriculture technologies let us domesticate barley, wheat, and lentils, so we didn't have to constantly travel to put food in our stomachs. We've spent our lives since then looking for ways to reduce the heavy lifting. The Industrial Revolution meant labor-intensive hand production methods were given over to machines. People could move to the city where the new middle class could find other pursuits. When automation hit the scene, we also gave the heavy thinking to these machines, and they've become twice as smart every two years. We've traveled to space, and 20 years later, we have the same smarts in our pockets. We are now freer to want, want cheaper and faster. We allow machines to do more of our work for us. 70% of all trades made on the U.S. stock market in 2011 were made by algorithms, not people. We autofill, we store in the cloud, we find love with a swipe right. Algorithms and artificial intelligences process this information for us. However, today it seems we serve computers. Most of us spend more time gazing into our four-inch screens than into the eyes of our loved ones. Smartphones are setting us an endless stream of to-dos and checklists. In an attempt to alleviate this, companies are creating new connected products to sense, learn, and ultimately predict our every need. Collectively, these products are known as IoT, or the Internet of Things. You may have heard of domestic applications of IoT, curtains that raise with you in the morning, fridges that restock themselves. But what about the toilets that check your health and notify you if you're pregnant? IoT is expanding across industries, from manufacturing to gardening, from energy to mobility. It's estimated that presently 1% of everything that could be connected to the internet is. Imagine a world where the other 99% are also constantly sensing, storing, and communicating data about every aspect of our lives. What kind of hardware systems does the smart home use? There are three types of hardware. The first is the personal sensor. The second is the network of the home. The third is the network of the home. The home is the home. How do you see smart homes changing people's lives in the future? え、住まいになっていることになります。え、1階に言えないことなんですけども、えっと、センサーが発達することによって、個人ごとのデータが溜まることによって、ま、病気のきっかけですとか、転倒とか事故が分かるようになると思いますので、それを使うことによって、え、
it's possible to use various sensors to track your activities, to track your habits. Uh, in some cases, uh, I know of instances where you have a smart home where there will be a camera built into a device to allow for uh, various metrics to be measured, but unwittingly allowing hackers to, say, peer into your living room. And so everything is a two-sided coin where there's pros, but if the security isn't addressed, uh, they could easily be used for a con and, and people fail to realize that yet. Would you live in a smart home or work in a smart office? Me personally, I would love to because then I can get my hands dirty on all the devices, test them, find out issues. Hack them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as a normal user, I would still be a little skeptical on what kind of devices I deploy. Because the vendors want to reach to the market quickly, they are not giving uh, as much attention to the security. They just want to quickly build it up and ship it. So that's where the major problem lies. And then there are uh, three major attack surfaces that we are going to see. Uh, one is the controlling app, the mobile, the client side. One is the device itself. And one is the cloud where the whole user data is going to be saved. So we have to be very careful on what kind of data is being saved and how it is being saved. As soon as this gets mass adoption at the levels it will, and as soon as more data gets online, how that's protected, how that could be erased, how could that be forgotten. Uh, these issues, uh, at least from a Japan context, has not been uh, debated. Around the world, they're starting to be addressed, but I think we're still in the infancy stage of what that really means. What do you think businesses should be aware of when they're implementing Internet of Things strategies? When you deal with IT, it's not uh, an IT issue. It is a management issue. It's a risk issue. It involves the entire company. With that said, it's very, very important that you do cybersecurity at the design level, like the automobile or the airplane. If you think about it, these are actually designed security first in a transparent, almost invisible background manner, and that's where we need to get to. There's little doubt that the Internet of Things is the future because we've always sought out and embraced ways to make our lives easier. But it's clear developers and consumers need to think about privacy, and not just as an afterthought. It might be useful for navigation for my car to know my location, but does it need access to my social media accounts? Does the information that's collected by these devices need to be stored forever? If most of us strive to live in the moment, then perhaps so too should our data. With these devices entering our homes and offices, building trust through ethical use of our personal and professional data will become crucial for these technologies to truly succeed. So, as we adopt digital systems and products to make our lives easier, we each produce exponential amounts of data about ourselves and our businesses. Some we willingly share, but much of it we unwittingly contribute. We are increasingly placing our trust in third parties. Does the data that's already out there need to be stored permanently? Do we need regulation to ensure encryption and data decay? How can we protect our legacy from being exposed and used against us? The responsibility for our security starts with us. It's the domain of personal and professional management. Today, we are at a crossroad. Adopting these systems gives us a huge advantage, but we must take stock in how we manage and regulate them to protect us as individuals and as businesses. <laughs>